Would you recommend an IVA to no. a friend? No, 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 no. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even recommend it to my worst enemy. They call it the debt solution of choice, but for some, it's plunging them into greater financial ruin. I'm still li literally on the line if I'm lucky. I mean, I've been, to fear, I've been to fear banks in that time three times. My whole life, I just felt that everything was collapsing and they'll tell you it's the best thing, but it's the worst thing. I don't know how they can do this and get away with it. Individual voluntary arrangements can write off your debt in five years at pennies to the pound. But are big companies mis-selling the solution and making millions out of some of Britain's most vulnerable? Well, it will ruin people's lives. It has done, and it is going to continue to do so. I do think there's potentially a, a scandal there because a lot of people, you know, shouldn't have been put onto IVAs. Demand for debt help is set to explode after the pandemic, and critics say the government must step in to protect those dreaming of a debt-free life. I believe they should get compensation. Mis-selling is mis-selling. Two years ago, Claire from East Sussex found herself in thousands of pounds of debt, causing her huge amounts of stress and worry. Yeah, I've made a lot of mistakes when I was younger, financially, like you do. I think you learn from them, but I couldn't pay these debts off. Um, I'd let things slide really badly. It was around that time Claire decided to look for a way out. Couldn't escape the debt and I felt that everything was just closing down on me. Um, I went online and basically looked for some help and a company called Credit Fix um, got in contact with me. Um, I can't remember how I searched but it was that company that then came to me and said that they could help me. Credit Fix, the UK's largest individual voluntary arrangement provider, told her their debt product could help clear her debts. They said that they'd put all my debts into one affordable monthly payment um, and the creditors would stop chasing me. So I thought, oh, you know, maybe this is a good thing. An individual voluntary arrangement or IVA is an agreement to pay back creditors through monthly instalments usually over five or six years. An insolvency provider will meet with creditors to agree to write down the debts, working out how much the debtor must pay each month. But after being in an IVA for a year, Claire was shocked to find that most of the money she'd paid into her IVA hadn't gone to her creditors like Lowell and Vanquist Bank. Instead, the majority had gone straight into Credit Fix's pocket. I believe that they're not doing what they should do. They're not paying money off the creditors. Um, Lowell sent a letter to my parents' address um, and they've hardly paid anything off them. Um, I thought that the money was being distributed to all the people that I owe the money to and I think only one or two people have received any money and the rest has gone in fees for them. After speaking with us, Claire got back in touch with Credit Fix who told her that in the two years she has paid into her IVA, £1,300 has gone in fees and only £205 has gone to her creditors. We travelled to Luton to meet a couple who also got into an IVA. A problem with Mick and Steph's tax credits in 2018 led to their debts spiralling out of control. They were put in touch with IVA provider Hanover Insolvency. Until March 2021, it was run by Adam Deering, known for sharing photos of his luxury cars to his half a million Instagram followers. Deering remains a major shareholder. After three years, Mick had paid thousands into his IVA and his creditors had only received less than 10%. I have paid to date £3,200. I have 10 creditors and they have only received £32 each. That is really shocking. That's when you told me that, I was just like, and that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. And when Mick and Steph looked closely at the fees, they noticed payments for things like storage in a PPI search, neither of which they knew anything about. This is storage costs £300. I have no idea what this means, and uh, they have nothing of mine to store. Yeah, that's, that is, that's strange. That is a very, very weird fee. Yeah, so there's another charge here, £360 PPI search fee. 
Yeah, we never asked them to search for any PPI. So why would we have to pay that fee? Hello? We listened to a recording of the call between Mick and Hanover Insolvency to set up the IVA. Hanover made no mention of these fees. Dylan Quayle, who is responsible for Mick and Steph's IVA and is a director at Hanover, declined an interview. He said he could not comment on their experience due to data protection laws, but that all fees and disbursements charged are set out fully in every client's proposal for an IVA, which every client is required to review and sign. But Mick says his ADHD has always affected his reading, something Hanover never asked him about. Despite the high fees, for some, IVAs can be a lifesaver, getting them out of debt and protecting assets like their house that they could lose through bankruptcy. IVAs are the UK's most used debt solution, with around 80,000 people starting one last year. Peter Sargent has been in the insolvency industry for 40 years and is a former president of R3, a trade association which represents insolvency practitioners. IVAs are a really good tool for an insolvency practitioner and can provide some great solutions. I've used them in the past with many individuals, but in business and personally, and they've worked. Sometimes they don't work because life circumstances change. Some things happen and it just doesn't work out. Sometimes the individual has a change of heart and just becomes a very difficult person to deal with. Hello, this is Keith White speaking. Keith White has been a debt advisor for 14 years and has seen how IVAs can help people with high levels of debt. I think they remain a very, very good product or solution for some people in some circumstances. I love to organise IVAs for people because A, I, I believe that they're, you know, it can work and B, obviously that's my job and I, I, I hope I do it well, but I also hope I do it responsibly and that's, that's a bit different. But despite setting up IVAs for people in debt himself, Keith acknowledges there are issues within the IVA market. It's also a, a kind of an industry that's open to abuse, really, I think, or open to question, at least. So it can become a, quite a salesy thing where companies are, are, are really just looking at profits and not necessarily looking after the, always the best interests of the clients. And many critics say this is an industry-wide problem. Earlier this year, former interim president of the Financial Conduct Authority, Chris Woolard, released an independent review into the insolvency sector. The review said the message from both consumer advocates and creditors was clear. The IVA market is broken. IVAs are one of the only for-profit insolvency solutions. Their high fees have driven an explosion of large volume providers and critics say this has led to companies targeting more people from poorer backgrounds who previously would not have been considered for an IVA. We've seen a decline or a stagnation in the number of bankruptcies and debt relief orders while IVAs have really increased at a rapid rate. And this seems to be an expansion of IVAs into uh, another market which is maybe lower income households who are not initially being sold IVAs when IVAs were first developed as a consumer remedy in the 2000s, but the IVA market has expanded to this group now. And what are the problems with that? IVAs, generally speaking, provide a worse outcome for clients than bankruptcy or debt relief orders, right? The client has to pay thousands of pounds in fees. They have to make repayments to their creditors for periods of five, six, seven years. And there's a high chance of the IVA failing. So just at a, an aggregate level, this looks like a bad outcome for for consumers and for financially struggling households. We've found evidence that suggests some vulnerable people in debt may have been missold an IVA. To work out whether someone qualifies for an IVA and whether they can afford it, companies must first calculate a debtor's income and expenditure. The difference between the two is then paid towards the IVA. But we've seen inaccuracies in some people's IVA proposals with expenditures appearing to be understated to make the monthly payments look affordable. This happened to one woman from Northern England who wished to remain anonymous. We're calling her Lisa. A bad relationship left her in unmanageable debt while looking after three young children. I was in a relationship that, was, that wasn't that was good. Um, he got me in a lot of debt. 
um, put things in my name. Um, and then when we split up, he it was all in my name. So I had sort of no way to deal with it. Moved back in with my parents. Um, I had three children at the time. And I, yeah, that broke down. I had, I had to live on sofas for some like about six months. It was horrible. Despite having no assets and being unemployed, she was signed up for an IVA. At the time I wasn't employed because I, I said I've had three children on my own. I'd, I'd lost the home because they wouldn't let me stay. I couldn't stay there because I was then on benefits. After over three years of trying to meet the £80 monthly payments, she went to an independent debt advisor, Amy Taylor, who is helping her to end her IVA. Amy says the income and expenditure figures were stretched beyond her clients' limits. To pay this IVA, you're going to have to commit for five years to live in on the absolute breadline and you're going to have to cut back on everything. To me, this isn't a reasonable, realistic uh, income and expenditure. This is, this is really sacrificing for five years whilst you've got young children, you know, in order to pay the IVA. The firm that arranged Lisa's IVA has since transferred its caseload to another company. Mick and Steph also say their income and expenditure figures were inaccurate. One thing that really disappoints me is the figure up the top here, which is the 2,202, which is my monthly income. That was based on a five-week month from one of the month statement. It was the highest amount that I had earned over a three month period and they pinpointed that. Mick sent three months of bank statements to Hanover, but the person assessing his case was only passed on the month with the highest income. So if I handed you this piece of paper now, would, does this to you look like your life or somebody else's? <laughs> well and truly, someone else's. Yeah, somebody else's. It's definitely not ours. Yeah. Definitely not. And some experts are concerned that the massaging of income and expenditure figures is a common tactic within the IVA industry. Damon Gibbons is the director of Think Tank Centre for Responsible Credit. He's been trying to improve the regulation of credit markets for over 20 years. We know that there are a lot of concerns that those debt advisors have, that the income and expenditure that was originally completed was out of all bearing to the person's actual circumstances. We've also come across situations where people feel pressured into actually promising more than they would otherwise be able to afford on the basis that if they don't do that then they won't be given access to the procedure. There is an alternative to an IVA or bankruptcy. For people with low incomes a debt relief order or DRO can write off someone's debts in a year they only have to pay a one-off £90 fee. There are tight rules on who can apply, making it only available to those with small disposable incomes and low value assets. IVA companies are required to explain to the debtor the pros and cons of all the different debt solutions. But Claire recalled that despite being homeless, Credit Fix never mentioned the possibility of a DRO. I was homeless because I lost my home where I was living due to being in debts and stuff. I couldn't rent anywhere. So I sofa surfed, stayed at my parents for a while. I mean, I went through the paperwork and it says that, that apparently they talked for all the other options with me, but I don't recall that. Um, when I've looked for myself recently, um, I do think a dry would have been better for me. But at the time they told me that the IVA was the, the most suitable thing. So I believed them because I thought, well, you know, they help people all the time. Mick and Steph were also told they didn't qualify for a debt relief order as their combined assets, their cars, were worth over £1,000. But Mick says Hanover overestimated their values. You know, I'm not going to lie, it was a brilliant car. It never done us a wrong, it was just an old vehicle. But they made out that it was worth £995. <laughs> And it was nowhere near that worth that month. I would, you would struggle to get £300 for this vehicle. And Hanover knew this was the case when they set up the IVA. In a call from 2018, they asked Mick how much their cars were worth. So the, the vehicles you have, what would you say yeah. an estimated value are? Well, I'd say about 400 quid on the Zafira. Yeah. And about 400 quid on the Saab. No problem. 
Despite this, the IVA proposal stated that Mick estimated the vehicles were worth £995 each. We discussed these cases with Peter Sargent, the former president of R3. I think they, what, what they're really trying to say is it's not mis, it's just bad advice. And they, should, they, you know, they shouldn't have been in an IV in the first place. They should have done some other kind of debt procedure. Nobody's come back to me with a, a, a good case which would involve a mis-selling claim in an IVA because you've got to calculate your loss and what's the loss to the debtor. They're effectively having the debts written off one way or another, um, which might sound harsh, uh, but that's how it is. But critics of the IVA industry disagree. Well, in this field, bad advice is fundamentally mis-selling. If, if you're not getting the advice right, you're not taking the person's particular circumstances into account, and you're not getting them the most appropriate solution for them, then it's either, as you say, bad advice, or let's face facts, because it's driven by profits, it's mis-selling. And those struggling to afford their IVAs say the loss goes beyond a financial one. Everything has sort of changed for me. My, my, it's, my health has been terrible um, because I'm stressing and worrying and, and everything over money. Yeah, it's, it's just this knot, like noose around your neck that's getting tighter and tighter and tighter with them. Critics say that mis-selling leads to a higher likelihood of an IVA failing. This happens when the debtor can't meet the monthly payments. Figures from the Insolvency Service show at least one in four IVAs fail in the first three years. This is an increase of around 11 percentage points compared to 10 years ago. Most of the fees are paid to IVA companies in the first two years. So failing often leaves debtors having paid off almost none of their debt. Peter Woolwork represented creditors for over 10 years. He's been researching the effect failed IVAs have on both creditors and their debtors. We don't want a consumer to have to uh, pay into something that is paying an IP and getting no benefit for themselves. In other words, if it fails early, uh, a creditor is going to reinstate the debts, the customer is going to feel that all the money they've paid into the IVA has just gone to an IP, it's not as simple as that, but it's going to feel that way, and they're going to be worse off than when they first started. So it's absolutely critical to get that um, debt solution right in the, in the first place. To reduce the chance of an IVA failing and to ensure the monthly payment amounts are appropriate, each year the debtor's income and expenditure figures are reviewed. If they get a higher paying job or receive unexpected money, they're told they must pay more each month. But we've seen IVA companies appearing to raise the monthly payment amounts to an unaffordable level. Someone this happened to has been in an IVA with credit fix for three years. She wished to be anonymous. We're calling her Claudette. They wanted me to go from a £162 payment a month to a 354. I said, no, I don't want it. They told me, yes, but you've had had a pay rise, so you're gonna have to pay this. I said, no, I'm not gonna pay this. I'd rather stop paying everything. And with no reason, she just decided, okay, well, the last price, the last I can do for you is 250. How can she figure this out? Mm. How can they change the data like that to whatever they want? The data she used are completely 100% wrong. There's nothing in there that is correct. It's terrible. Credit Fix declined an interview to comment on both Claudette and Claire's IVAs, but told us the failure rate for IVAs administered by Credit Fix is below the industry average. They say that to be eligible for an IVA, applicants must meet a set of criteria relating to income, assets and the level of debt owed, and that they have a robust complaints process. Credit Fix say they will be investigating the specific issues raised as a matter of urgency. So with all the issues the consumers and critics point to, why are so many people still getting set up in IVAs? Well, ever seen adverts like these claiming they can write off large amounts of your debt? These are produced by companies known as introducers. Introducers receive around £1,000 per client they refer to an IVA provider. 
You'll often spot them on social media and with paid adverts placing them at the very top of the Google search rankings. Some are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, but others are unregulated and many make misleading claims that appear to go unpunished. Mick and Steph first found out about IVAs through an introducer firm called Debt SOS. There was a company that contacted me um, and telling me about debt solutions and stuff like that. Oh, so they, they cold called you? Yes, they cold called me. They called me on my mobile phone. At one point it was on the hour every hour, especially as it came to the decision making. Mick says Debt SOS claimed an IVA was a solution backed by the government. This is untrue. They sort of like just said that this was a government backed arrangement that hundreds and thousands of people are doing at the moment to get themselves out of debt. So to me, that sounded like, you good know, idea. the good idea. We've also seen introducer firms like Giraffe Money claiming to be featured in the press to give them legitimacy. But when asked for proof, they told us they'd only featured as adverts and have now changed their website. And in some of the most extreme cases, we've seen introducers clearly trying to imitate debt advice charities. Take National Debt Advice Line, for instance. You'd be forgiven if you mistook that for the charity National Debt Line. We showed this site to advertising expert Professor Claire Bourne. Down at the bottom it says, <laughs> so nationaldebtadviceline.org.uk, which sounds like it's something really official, maybe a huge charity and quite important, is a trading style of Debt Movement UK, previously named Jarvis Insolvency Limited. My problem is the name of this organization and the trust that people might put in because they think it's something quite official and potentially backed by the government. Debt Movement UK told us their regulator found no issues with the trading style and that the website complies with government guidance in all other respects. Debt SOS and Help Clear My Debt didn't respond to our requests for an interview or a statement. The Financial Conduct Authority also declined an interview, but told us they are working with other regulators to reduce the harm that IVAs can produce for people that use them. They said they have written to some debt companies asking for them to make improvements, and that the FCA recognised that the risk of consumer harm from firms operating the debt packager model is increasing. They said they are looking at commission rates in the industry and want to ensure advice provided by debt packager firms across the market is in the best interest of consumers and allows them to make informed decisions about how to deal with their debts. The Advertising Standards Authority has also taken action against some of the most misleading sites, punishing two introducers earlier this year for making unsubstantiated claims. But Professor Claire Bourne says the regulators are both too overwhelmed to cope with the problem. They don't have enough hands, they don't have enough eyeballs to deal with the number of complaints that are coming in. We are dealing with a growing mountain of a problem with two regulators that are understaffed, underbudgeted to deal with the problem. We put our findings on the whole IVA market to Labour MP Yvonne Fauvarg, chair of the cross-party parliamentary group for debt and personal finance. Mis-selling is mis-selling and actually in some cases it appears that it's more than just a mis-selling. Mis-selling and misrepresentation under the Trade Descriptions Act should be a criminal offence. So if the government doesn't step in soon, what impact do you think that will have on the British public given the growing need for debt advice? I think now is the time to prioritise that. If they don't look at how they can deal with all these extra people in debt, because don't forget there are, were already a large number of people in debt before the pandemic, if they don't deal with it, we will find it becoming another public health emergency and it will cost more both in human terms and in financial terms in the long run. Sarah Williams runs the popular money advice blog Debt Camel. She and other experts say mis-selling has been evident in the industry for many years, but the market's multiple regulators haven't taken enough action. What are your general thoughts on regulation of the IVA market? Ineffective. The insolvency service has known there is an increasing problem with IVAs being missold for 
four or five years. Even back before that, there, there, it, it, was, it was a small problem. But as the number of IVAs has gone up, so the, the mis-selling has gone up. And the insolvency service knows this. So I think it's widely accepted that these practices have been taking place and that they have to stop. And the next question is, um, how do we stop them? And uh, how far do we go in stopping them, I guess? The government and insolvency service both declined requests for interviews, but in a joint statement told us, an IVA can provide vital support to people in financial difficulty, but that they are continually looking to improve how IVAs work by publishing improved guidance, advice, and updating the professional standards for insolvency practitioners. They say that they encourage anyone considering an IVA to ensure that they seek debt advice from an FCA regulated advisor. But many say more political action is needed to address issues in the IVA industry. I think the government does need to step in. I think there either needs to be further oversight in terms of the regulation process or there needs to be real teeth given to the FCA or, or another body that can take action against certain companies. And if that means that the only way to do it is to actually just take it out of the private sector altogether, it becomes a, a government-led or run um, project, then, then fair enough. Damon Gibbons believes they should go further. Well, I think IVA should be abolished altogether, to be quite frank. So <laughs> I see no reason why we ought to have an IVA market. It will ruin people's lives. It has done, and it is going to continue to do so. So something has to be done about it. And for those already well into their IVAs who feel they've been missold, any changes in regulation would be little consolation, with their lives already drastically affected. Looking back at your IVA and, and the situation you're in now, I mean, would you recommend an IVA to a friend? No, 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 no. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even recommend it to my worst enemy. It's the worst thing you can do, worst thing. And they'll tell you it's the best thing, but it's the worst thing because it hangs around your neck for six years and you feel like everything, you're obligated to them. And now I just feel I've got things going on. My mental health is not very good. Um, I struggle with daily living and I just feel they've made my life 10 times worse. I mean, I tried to take an overdose because I felt I couldn't go on um, and I, I couldn't get anywhere with my anything. I, my whole life, I just felt that everything was collapsing and that's down to debt and not being supported. In addition to the emotional toll of a five-year IVA, it stays on credit records for another five years after that, making moving house or paying for anything in instalments much more difficult. The IVA is restricting me from moving forward with my business, so I think that's it's massive, one of the yeah. big things for me. You know, and it's embarrassing as well, because obviously, you know, they, they monitor your accounts, and like birthdays and stuff like that, even Christmases where we'd get family members that would offer to give us some money towards it. And uh, we're, we're just, we panic, like, don't put it in our account, they'll see it, you know, and if they see it, they'll want it, and it's, that's how bad it is. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they want to take everything. And with the kids, my daughter's just turned 18, and she has got a full-time job as a carer, and she applied for a mobile contract for herself to get her mobile and she was declined because of our IVA. Lisa is now trying to get a debt relief order, but has been told she'll first have to wait three to six months for her IVA to be cancelled. Well, it's so hard to like pay, pay my bills and keep on top of it. It's just been a, a scramble and a fight for years, so my aim is to sort of get debt free and I want to buy my house. That's, that's it really, it doesn't sound like a lot, but I want security for my kids. But there has been some progress for Claudette. 24 hours after we contacted Credit Fix for a statement, a senior member of staff called her. He admitted her income and expenditure figures were incorrect and reduced her monthly payments from £250 a month back down to £162. He also apologised for how the case had been handled and wiped off over £4,000 of fees from her IVA. But despite this, Claudette says an IVA was still the wrong option for her. I will never 
ever recommend an IVA to anyone. I would say to, I would tell everyone, stay well away from them. They, they, they're not there to help you. They're just here, there to be after your money. Claire's debts are being investigated by the financial ombudsman. She hopes that their investigations can help free her from the IVA and finally her debts. I'd like to be out of the financial burdens that I've got and just live in my life and spending time with my grandchildren and my sons and having a happy life without the stress. Just for the stress to go would be nice.